Good morning. Thank you for coming this morning to the Midwest Dream Car Collection for our featured car presentation this month on the DeLorean. I understand that we have a very special guest from the past that's going to be arriving here shortly, Doc Brown. So, has Doc arrived yet, or did he overshoot the, the year? Well, there he is! Doc Brown, in a former life, is Brian Strauss. And uh, Brian is uh, retired from AIB, where he worked for 28 years, retired a couple years ago. And Brian is on our research advisory team here at the museum, with which we're, we're honored to have him. If you see a white 2018 Charger RT with the license plate white knuckle, that's Brian driving around. So he's not driving a Zorn, he drives a Charger. That's right. But uh, anyway, let's give Doc Brown a warm welcome. We're interested in hearing about the Dorian. Thanks, Doug. <clears throat> so bear with me. So there's a little history of this whole outfit. Uh, when I was at AIB, Halloween got to be a greater and greater contest every year. And so this was the last year before I retired. I dressed up like Doc Brown. Ward, Mor Ward and Brenda let me borrow the DeLorean to come roaring into the parking lot. And it was, it was quite an entrance. So um, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to lose the mask since I'm six feet away. <clears throat> I'm going to lose this because it's a little disconcerting to try to talk in that. <clears throat> So thanks everybody for, for coming out this morning. Um, as Doug said, I'm on the research advisory committee. I've been involved with the museum before it was a museum. And uh, when we got to put them together some different programs, he said, well, what car would you like to talk about? And I said, I would love to talk about the DeLorean because I think all cars have a story that can connect you to them. And I've got a couple of connections to DeLorean. I don't own this one, uh, wish I did. Um, but in 1982, I was living in South Florida. My wife uh, had got a new job. We needed a second car, and so we went looking car shopping. Um, and one of the things that the sales guy tried to sell me was a 1981 DeLorean DMC-12. Now, unfortunately, it was about two or three times the amount of money that I had to spend, so I didn't end up buying that one. Um, I bought a Volkswagen Scirocco instead, which was a lot of fun, but it was not a, not a DeLorean. Um, and then, like I said, the other part of the connection that I've got is that uh, when I dressed up a few years ago, I had the opportunity to take my grandson Thomas, who was then a little more than one, and he dressed up like Marty McFly, and we drew a lot of attention down on the end of the cul-de-sac. So I love a good story about a car. So what I'm going to tell you today is a story about the DeLorean and how it kind of came to be. It's more than just what is that car, what's the spec, how many horsepower. We'll go through that stuff. But I think it was really interesting that once you look at how did this car come to be that really only had a two, barely a two-year life, has become so iconic in so many different ways. So I'm going to kind of talk you through that story here for about the next 30 minutes or so. Um, and we'll talk about who was the guy that it's named after, John DeLorean, how was the car built and why was it basically kind of a failure, and then how did it become popular again as most people know it through this sort of get up in the Back to the Future franchise. So let's start the story. Starts with John DeLorean. Um, John DeLorean was a guy who served in the military, got out, had a passion for cars, got an auto automotive engineering degree. While he was doing that, he sold life insurance for some time and uh, was frankly pretty good at it. So he was definitely a sales guy to start with. Um, he got an opportunity to go to work for Chrysler after a very short stint with Packard, um, but spent the majority of his time early at Chrysler in a program that they had that allowed him to go to school, work at Chrysler, and get a master's in automotive engineering. And it was um, there that he really got a start for what became car design that was so important to him and really set the stage for what we're talking about. So in 1952, he'd been with Chrysler for a few years, and that's when he um, graduated with a master's degree and joined working for them, 1952. So that really set the stage for John DeLorean and his passion for car engineering and car design. Um, only lasted about four years, and then he moved on, 1956, to uh, the G General Motors Pontiac division, and he became an assistant to a guy named Bunky Knudsen, 
there's a good name for you, right? Bunky Knudsen, who was the general manager, and he got to be very good friends with him and saw Bunky as a bit of a mentor to him as well. And so it was a lot of the influence that Bunky Knudsen had on him that really, John DeLorean says, set what his, um, what his future really was. Where John DeLorean really made his name at Pontiac, though, was this car. 1964 Pontiac GTO, and there's a really nice example of a GTO out in the parking lot earlier this morning, if you could see that out there. This is what distinguished Pontiac from the other divisions of General Motors as the muscle car division, and really kind of set the whole trend for what we came to call muscle cars in the 60s and 70s. It all started with this Pontiac GTO, and it was in very large part to John DeLorean's influence and in pushing that forward. He frankly fought with the guys from GM quite a bit about a lot of different things. They kept trying to rein him in on horsepower, and he kept going with more and more horsepower. Um, but as a result of how popular this car became, it projected him on a very quick climb up General Motors. And by, by the time he was 40 years old, he became the youngest vice president in General Motors at the time. Maybe the youngest still. I don't know uh, what that history looks like. So it really helped to set him apart. Um, most people know 1965, 66, Ford came out with the Mustang. And they started to further define what that muscle car pony market looked like. Um, John DeLorean uh, went to the uh, executives at General Motors and says, I want to promote this car. 1966 Pontiac Banshee prototype that he said, I think we can be really competitive with that Mustang that's out there with this. Uh, powers that be at GM said, mm, no, we've got another car that we're really trying to push, a little thing called a Corvette, and we're afraid this would be too competitive with that customer that we're looking to put into a Corvette. So, didn't really work out for John, but he wasn't, he wasn't completely discouraged. So he said, okay, fine. You've got a Camaro. I'm going to develop this. 1967 Pontiac Firebird. So this kind of became John DeLorean's next big success was the Firebird. Um, got a lot of market share from that. Got a lot of attention for it. And one thing as I start to flip through these pictures, I want you to kind of start looking at the, pic looking at the cars that John DeLorean designed early in his life. You're going to start to see a lot of things show up in this DeLorean that ultimately bears his name. Um, after the uh, Firebird, DeLorean did a revamp on the Grand Prix. 1969 Pontiac Grand Prix. Um, the year before, they only sold 32,000 Grand Prix. The year that this redesign came out, 112,000. So quadrupled what the production was on this particular car. He also negotiated that he would have a one-year lead before 1970 Chevrolet Monte Carlo came out. So shared a lot of the same body frame and parts and chassis and all that kind of stuff, but he got a one-year advance before they would come out with the Monte Carlo to basically be a little bit competitive to what he was doing there. So again, very big success of, uh, of what he's been doing so far. A little lesser known car that he was also a part of was a Chevy Vega. And that's that yellow Chevy Vega up there on the top corner. And down on the lower right is a Chevy Vega Cosworth, which basically got a high output engine put into it and became very well respected on the racing circuit. That all happened after John left. And frankly, the Vega debacle was one of the reasons that he left. The Vega was uh, not a very good car, had a lot of quality issues. Uh, the factory was pushed really hard to turn out a lot of cars every hour beyond what they were really capable of doing in a quality manner. And so the Vega kind of became a joke. And anybody who lived through the 70s, a Vega was kind of a joke. I see some heads nodding. And, and that's part of what I think ultimately led John DeLorean to go, you know what, I've had a lot of fun designing some really nice cars, but I think I'm going to move on. So in uh, 1973, and I want you to remember this quote because this becomes a little prophetic in a few years. John DeLorean said, there's no forward response to General Motors what the public wants today. A car should light up people's eyes 
They just want to offer rebates to make people buy cars that they don't really want to buy. So he had become very disenfranchised with the, with the General Motors model. So all that setup, hopefully that's not too much on Del John DeLorean, but I think you really need to understand he had a passion for cars and he understood what consumers wanted and he really enjoyed powerful muscle cars, but he felt like he couldn't do what he wanted to do at General Motors. So he sets out on his own. And that becomes this, the DeLorean Motor Car Company. So that's 1973. So he'd been in the business for 20, 20 plus years, um, very well established, and decided I'm going to build a car with my own name to it. Early car design, he went to a guy named, I'm gonna have to read this right, Giorgetti Giugiari, I think is pretty close to how it's said, an Italian designer who had worked uh, for Alfa Romeo and had worked for Volkswagen, and he had designed a prototype car for Porsche a few years earlier called the Tap Tapiro, Taparo, I don't know how to say that for sure, and that was this car. Wow, what's that look like? So we gotta give Giorgetti a lot of the influence on where the DeLorean ultimately ends up because there's a lot of similarities there, including stainless steel body, including gold uh, wing doors. So this really is part of what sets the design for the DeLorean that John is ultimately going to build with his name on it. Um, the prototype was known as the DSV-1, DeLorean Safety Vehicle 1. And there's a Bricklin sitting over there that the Bricklin actually had a very similar designation as a safety vehicle. Um, and that was around part of what John wanted to build into the car to not just be a sports car, but to have a high degree of safety as well. So they initially called it the DSV-1. That lasted for the first prototype, and then they decided to call the DSV-12. And you'll see the placard there refers to that. The 12 didn't mean 12 cylinders, unfortunately, that would have been awesome, put a 12 cylinder engine in that car. Um, the DSV-12 stood for a target price of $12,000, was what they were trying to shoot for this car to be in 1981. And we'll talk about pricing a little bit later on, but that's really where the 12 comes from. Nothing related to uh, horsepower or anything else. He also had some very big plans that would have set it apart from a lot of the other sports cars that were out there at the time. He wanted to use a technology called elastic reservoir molding to help form the body panels and the, the substructure to the car. He actually bought the patent rights to this kind of technology. Um, I've got a diagram I'll show you about that. He wanted to use a mid-engine layout. Now, if you can see this car here, it didn't end up but uh, that was his original design was to go mid-engine. He also wanted to put airbags in it in 1981. Not too many cars had airbags in 1981 and the original steering wheel had a very large center hub to it that would have included that particular airbag. He wanted to put 10 mile an hour bumpers on it, meaning you could hit something at 10 miles or less and do no damage. They would just recoil back into the, the substructure. And he wanted to put very high performance Pirelli tires on it. So he had a lot of visions about what this car should look like. This is the diagram of that ERM, where you can see, hopefully, um, the very bottom part was gonna be steel chassis, and then it was basically um, a combination of high molded plastic and fiberglass, and then the stainless steel on the outside. And the advantage of that would have been weight savings, um, would have been cheaper to produce and retool. <clears throat> so he had a lot of visions on using some new technology that was out there. In that mid-engine design, the original thing he wanted to put in it was a Wankel rotary engine. And there's a few Wankels out there right now. This was fairly new technology back in, uh, back in the 70s and 80s. So Wankel engine, not Willy Wonka engine. So those of you that uh, know uh, that version from 1970, no not the Johnny Depp version of Willy Wonka either. But a Wankel engine was a rotary engine that is compared to the normal piston engines that most people understand. For every rotation, I don't know if there's a, for every rotation that you would see on this hub right here, 
you'd actually get three combustion explosions because this would turn around and would do a combination of intake and exhaust. And so for every full rotation, you actually got three firings. So you get really high RPMs out of a Wankel engine and you can get some pretty good horsepower and performance out of it. So that was the original thing that he wanted to do. Um, he was gonna buy it from a collaboration between Citroen and a German, car, a German engine company called NSU Motorwerken. Um, so he had that all lined out. He tried very hard to make it work, but they ran into a lot of engine problems. Um, that collaboration between Citroen and NSU ceased, and so the engine basically wasn't available at that point. So he looked at other options, and the next option that he liked was a Ford V6 Cologne engine, and looked at that for a while and would have a complete drivetrain with it. That ended up not really panning out. He switched over to a different combination from Citroen that also included the drivetrain. That would have worked. It didn't have quite as enough, enough power that he wanted, so he looked to turbocharge it, and the Citroen people were not happy with that decision. So they said, mm, why don't you go find an engine someplace else? So there were a number of things that happened as he was trying to design this car that ultimately kind of lead to some of the problems that we're going to talk about. It was a lot of stops and starts. There was a lot of changes. There was a lot of different designers came in. The engine was just one piece of it that he really had a hard time nailing down. But eventually what he gets to is this combination from Peugeot, Renault, Volvo that was a fuel injected V6 and also matched to a transmission from that same company. Because of what this engine was as compared to that original Wankel rotary engine, it moved to the rear of the car. So up until then, he was still hopeful that he could make it a mid-engine car design. And what's the advantage of a mid-engine car design? Weight distribution. You get really good weight distribution. As a result, you know, in a lot of respects, most uh, sports cars you like to try to keep them about 50-50 front to back weight ratio so that they handle pretty well. This thing ends up being 35% of the weight in the front and 65% of the weight in the back, which is not ideal for a sports car. And one more thing that's going to hurt him later on when we talk about how the DeLorean was received. This particular engine setup makes about 130 horsepower. Not great by today's standard, not bad by 1981. But as a comparison, I would tell you that a, a 1981 Corvette was producing 190 horsepower. Uh, a 1981 Porsche 911 was producing 204. So he was trying to compete with something that he was already losing that battle from a number standpoint when he had to compromise on the engine. As we can see here, uh, one of the things that really sets this car apart is the gold wing. He was not the first guy to come up with it. A lot of people consider this car, the 1954 Mercedes-Benz 300 gold wing, as one of the most beautiful cars ever made. And I know Doug's looking really hard to try to find one for the collection. And if anybody's got some pocket change you want to help, because they are pricey, really, really pricey. But that was something that, uh, that DeLorean wanted to have in there. And they certainly give it a very distinctive look. He uh, did a cryogenic preset on the torsion bars that keep, help keep that door up. It's quite heavy, but it does work um, pretty well because of the way it's designed. Uh, it's hard to see in the up position, but there's a real small cutout window there um, because you couldn't get the window all the way down into that door. But it did allow for easy egress into the car when you were parking right next to somebody because you don't need to swing the door wide open. And it certainly is distinctive. It's also one of the bigger quality issues that they had. Once they started producing this car, the fit on the doors was awful. And I'll talk about why that was in part. It wasn't necessarily a design as much as it was production. But a lot of those doors had to be reworked because of the way they were put together. As he was developing it, he also looked at a number of different designs on the, on the hood assembly as well. We can see on, on the 1981 we've got here, it's kind of a combination between those two. And the thing with the, the DeLorean was, even though it was only really two production years, 1981 and 1982, he never really distinguished when 81 stopped and when 82 began. He kind of kept making little changes all the way through, and that was another part of the problem with the production process was it was never really quite set, and they were playing with things and trying to improve things as they went along, and that led to part of the quality issues. 
The original uh, design you can see here, and I think it's the first 2,000 cars, actually had this fuel, uh, fuel fill-up uh, tank right here in the front, and it had this little um, flap that would have raised up right here. They had some production issues with that. They had some supply issues with that. They didn't really like cutting the hole in the stainless steel. So they ultimately took that out and it went with just a straight hood with the creases down it. And in the very latest models, and this one's early enough that it didn't get it, there was a DeLorean logo that was embossed right across there on the front. So a few things changed as he was going through before he got to that, um, that final design. So a lot of those things are, are what went into uh, really a, a lot of failures from a production standpoint. The other thing that was kind of minor, but he fiddled with it the whole time, was the antenna for the radio. It was originally a wire that was inset in the windshield itself. It had a horrible reputation that when you were trying to find a radio station, it would just seek and seek and seek and seek. The, rep the reception wasn't good enough. So then for a while, there's a few models that they cut a hole right in the front and put a regular whip antenna. I don't see something close like that Cadillac has a whip antenna on it up in that front corner. He didn't like the look of that. So he ultimately moved to what this car has, and that's a motorized antenna that actually comes up at the very back of the car. Wow, it's hard to walk around with a tool belt on. So the antenna here actually comes up back through this spot right here. You can see it. If you want to look later on, you can see where it's rounded out. So it was just things like that that made it really difficult um, to get the production going through. Ultimately, to kind of get all those things ironed out, he turned to one more guy, um, Colin Chapman, who was the engineer at Lotus. And there's another car in the collection here that shares uh, some, some relationship to Lotus, and that's the Tesla Roadster right back there that's actually built on a Lotus body. So Lotus is still around, but he brought in Colin Chapman to basically get things straightened out before we really went to full manufacturing. So that was another part of the problem was he was constantly bringing in different people, different designers, um, and actually um, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a black mark on Colin Chapman. He was very successful at Lotus. He was a racing guy. He um, actually died quite young of a heart attack, I think at age 54. And he got embroiled in a controversy because somehow about $28 million went missing from the DeLorean um, funding that they got from the UK government. So it's a bit of a black mark even on, on Colin Chapman. So there's a lot of things we'll talk about that coming up too. So ultimately they get set up. Not produced in the US, actually produced in Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, outside of Belfast, a little town named Dunmurray. And this is another part of why the DeLorean had some issues. The British government basically funded to build the facility. Six large manufacturing buildings were built exclusively to do this. Um, they hired in, not sure how many workers, a lot of workers to, to build these cars. Almost zero had any experience building cars. And that really proved to be a problem from the quality standpoint. But you can see in this photo down here, all the DeLoreans lined up there. Um, and here we've got a shot on the inside of all the DeLoreans being, being built out one at a time on these moving carousels that moved around. So now here we are coming up on um, 1980, December of 1980. Production is finally beginning to roll out. The first car came off the line January 21st of 1981. And they have dropped the DMC 12 name. Now they call it the DeLorean sports car. Because with all those changes in production, all those changes in the design, all the things that kept messing him up with engine layout and engine design and suppliers, he went from what was a target of $12,000 to $25,000 was the price of entry. Um, to, get a, to get a new DeLorean off the line. And a lot of people had, were on a waiting list and it actually paid a premium on top of that. So in 1981, $25,000, if you convert that over to dollars today, it would be like buying a new car for $72,000. That's a pretty nice car by today's standards, unless you're driving a Ford F-150 because that's about what Lesnar was going for. But uh, buying a new Ford F-150 might be about that range. Um, 
He looked at increasing the price in 1982 because of some design things that he was looking at, and that would be equivalent of $81,000. And by the time they finished production in what was very early 1983, they'd risen to $34,000 or almost $90,000. So the price just got clear out of control. Again, as a comparison, that 1981 Corvette with more horsepower and better performance would have cost you $32,000 as compared to 25. You could have bought a Porsche, no, 16,000, sorry, 16,000 for the vet. A Porsche 911 with way more performance would have cost you 32. So again, he was really missing the mark with where he was trying to go. So he starts selling these cars. By 1981, he has his October of 81, he sells the most cars of any month at 720. That's not, a great, that's not a great month. By December, the US economy was falling apart. And that really led to the demise of where this car company was going to was what the, what the economy did. Further, once the car came out and people started driving it and evaluating it, it was pretty largely panned. And after you, if you look at some articles today in like top 100 worst cars ever built, you're gonna find the DeLorean on there. Um, there were a lot of quality issues to the point that they were spending um, upwards of 80 hours on each car once it came into the U.S. just to correct the quality problems with it. There was problems with the alignment on the wheels, there was problems with the transmission and the clutch settings, there were problems with the door fitment, lots and lots of problems. That along with the performance just really didn't wow people. This is a quote from uh, Road and Track, not quick for a sports car in this price category. Again, zero to 60 with a manual of 8.8 .8 seconds. As compared to that Corvette again, a Corvette was turning it in 7.2 and that Porsche 911 was turning that in 6.3. So price was way out of whack, performance was way out of whack and things were looking bad with the economy. Um, and so what started as uh, a career leaving General Motors in 1973 basically is ended by December of 1982 to get things through there. They had made uh, about 7,500 units at that particular time when the company finally was, going, was heading into bankruptcy. It's thought that there's about 9,000 that were actually made by the time they got the ones that were sort of in production at the end of the run, finished them off with some parts, um, but it was kind of too little, too little too late. So the numbers are about 9,000 that were produced. It's thought there's about 6,500 of them out there still on the road. But at that point, um, it was just too far. The, uh, they went into receivership, they tried to sell them at the last minute. One of the things that John DeLorean did was he sent out a telegram to all the dealers in the United States saying, uh, 343 dealers actually saying, I want you each to buy six cars to try to save the company. He didn't get a response from any of the 343 dealers because they were still setting on inventory from the prior year. Um, and so they weren't gonna buy anymore. There was still a huge number that were setting on docks in California that they were trying to work through on the quality. So. It just was, uh, it just was uh, the end of the road. In a bit of an ironic twist to his comment about just trying to entice customers with rebates when he left General Motors, they actually tried to offer a five-year, 50,000-mile warranty, which was, again, kind of unheard of it in 1981. And um, nothing, nothing could sell him. He couldn't entice anybody to buy these particular cars. Um, added to that, John DeLorean, uh, was strapped for cash and for some reason he decided to do an illegal drug deal with an FBI informant who was undercover. And they arrested him, put him in prison, put him on trial. He actually got off. Uh, they cited his entrapment, but that was just one more thing that does not help you sell cars when you're a convicted drug dealer. So it, it all just kind of came crashing down at the very, very end. So. It's kind of a sad story. It's a, it's, a, it's a story of a guy that was very successful 
And when he tried to do it on his own, maybe because he didn't have the resources of General Motors behind him, just couldn't quite, quite pull it off. Now, let's shift to talking about the DeLorean itself just a little bit. All the DeLoreans were finished in stainless steel like this, except for a few that were fiberglass that were used for testing and as mules. Um, there were some that were painted as an option by the dealers, um, but they all left the factory with this brushed stainless steel. So you didn't have to worry about waxing it. You might, uh, you might get out some sandpaper or an abrasive pad and put the finish back into it, but that's what all you had to do. So that did, that did make it very unique. There were actually three cars that left the factory with a different finish. In 1980, I think 1980, American Express, in an effort to promote their gold card, American Express gold card, offered for $85,000 a gold-plated DeLorean. And there are still three of these that are in existence in private collections. I think actually one's in the Peterson Museum out in California, um, where they gold-plated them. And you can see the picture on the bottom is actually from the factory itself. Um, but other than that, every other one came out in stainless steel. So the total production, as I said, was uh, about 9,000 cars. This particular model that we've got here at the car collection is VIN number 5965. So it fits in that first lot of 6,700 that were produced in 1981. So it is a pretty fairly early model. Now, what people really mostly know the DeLorean as is from this connection to Back to the Future. And it's a really interesting um, thing because that's really made it way more popular than it was when it was uh, as a car for sale. They actually bought six DeLoreans from a private collector that they used for the, for the movies. Um, there was one in fiberglass that they flew when, the, when it had to do that, and they used um, the different ones for different scenes as they were setting up for internals or externals or going down the road, whatever it might look like. Initially, designers uh, for the movie wanted something that was gonna look like it was fixed together with common parts. Uh, Robert Zemeckis was the guy who wrote and then directed the Back to the Future. Um, Steven Spielberg did a few movies along the way was the executive producer. So those two guys were kind of collaborating with designers. They wanted something that looked like it was going to be fit together. Um, the initial idea was, let's do a refrigerator. I think Marty McFly stepping out of a frigidaire loses a little bit um, versus stepping out of the DeLorean. So Steven Spielberg was actually the guy, um, along with Zemeckis, that came up with the idea to use the DeLorean because Largely in part, the gull wings, and if you're familiar with the movie, he goes back to the 1950s, and this looks very alien spaceship from a 1970 sci-fi perspective. Um, Ford Motor Company actually offered to pay the, the uh, movie franchise $75,000 if they would use a Mustang. And someone was quoted as saying, Doc Brown doesn't drive a blankety blank in Mustang. <laughs> so, um, so they went with the DeLorean, and it's really, you know, became iconic, as I said, to what the movie franchise is. The interior was heavily modified. Here's a picture of Marty sitting in it with a lot of, a lot of add-ons. The, uh, the iconic flux capacitor back here in the background. I got my diagram of flux capacitor here someplace. Yeah, there's my diagram. Um, and so it, it became uh, highly modified, very popular. You can actually find a few guys out there that have these. There's a guy in Kansas City that has one that's basically a dead ringer for what was in the, uh, in the movies. And a few things that uh, were iconic. How fast did it have to go before it jumped time? 88 miles an hour. And they chose 88 miles an hour just because they thought it looked really cool on that LED readout. That wasn't actually a part of the original dash cluster anyhow, it was just added on to the top there to read out at, at 88 miles an hour. So only three of the cars still existed. They actually destroyed one of them. If you watched all three franchises at the very end of three, Marty comes back from the wild west on the train tracks and a train smashes through one of the DeLoreans and stops it ever going back or forward. Um, Again, so one of them was just trashed as a part of the movie itself. 
um, when I started looking around for some trivia about that, there were actually pieces of the smashed DeLorean that ended up with the old Planet Hollywood restaurant franchises that were, was it Schwarzenegger and Stallone and somebody else? And they went belly up here a few years ago and all those pieces just seem to have disappeared. So it's kind of interesting when you look back at, at what they've got. The other two are owned by Universal Studios. They basically let them go into disrepair. Um, and uh, finally, some guys that were uh, avid Back to the Future fans restored the car, including building out the flux capacitor. And, uh, and now it's at the Peterson Museum out in California also. So if you ever get out there, you can see one of the original ones from the movie. So the movie franchise really lets the DeLorean live on in, in classic feature. So one last thing is, if you wanted to get a DeLorean, like I said, there's about 6,500 thought to still be on the road from the original 81, 82, 83 production run. There is actually a, a company in Texas now that a uh, British car mechanic bought all the parts, rights, dies, tooling, all that kind of stuff when DeLorean went out of business. And he's been supplying parts for quite some time. I think actually this car was down there at that guy or, or somebody else that, that does restorations in Texas. And until just recently, like January of this year, there was a problem with actually producing new old DeLoreans because they didn't meet safety standards from the National uh, Highway Safety Transportation Board. But, uh, and just in January this year, they, there was a passage of a law that allowed for low volume vehicle manufacturing. So they're in the process of building new old DeLoreans from the original castings parts um, and, and stamps and all that kind of thing. And if you want to buy one, they're for a cool $100,000, which would be a lot more than finding a good used one at this point. Um, but they are going to start being back out there on the market again. So it's, a, I think, a really interesting story of a car that started off in 1960s muscle car technology let a guy who was iconic in the industry rose to a, about as high as you can go. They actually thought John DeLorean would be president of General Motors had he stayed, but he didn't. He left um, and started his own car company. Could have been very successful through a lot of miscues, was not very successful, and ultimately, like I said, uh, ended up uh, with, uh, well, I guess he wasn't convicted uh, of drug trafficking, but uh, uh, definitely a a black mark on, on who he was as a person and what he was trying to do as a business. So I think it's a, a super interesting story. I really like the DeLorean. It's one of a few cars that I've actually driven here in the collection. Honestly, it's, it's fun to drive. It's not very fast. Uh, it's not a lot of performance to it, but you do get a lot of attention when you drive it around. So uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention this morning. Um, as the tag on the DeLorean says in the movie, I am out of time. So thank you very much. <laughs>